in this week's parsha, the Torah portion of Chai Sora, there is a story which takes up the bulk of the Torah portion, and that is Avraham's servant finding a wife for Yitzchak. never names the servant. At one point, it just says, and Avram said to his servant, who is the elder of his household, who uh, is in charge of everything he has, but it never actually calls him Eliezer, but that's what we call him because that's who we think it is, Eliezer. And he puts him in charge of a project. The project is to find a wife for Yitzchak. I like the story. It's a fun story. It is fun. The, it, it, it is. It's a lot of cameras. Yeah. But to me, the funniest part of the story, it's it's got a funny ending. If you're following it, it's it's sort of funny because what happens is Eliezer goes with 10 camels laden with all kinds of stuff. At one point, Lavan spots Eliezer with the camels. Oh, actually, it's after Rivka has already been offering him water, etc. She's the one who goes and and tells him there's a guy out there. But when it describes Lavan, it says, When he saw the he, a nose ring and um, bracelets which uh, Eliezer had given her. So he sees that stuff. And she tells him that he's standing with camels. He's got camels with an S outside by the water. And he gets all excited and he goes out and you know he, he's thrilled to see Eliezer. So the way it's presenting it to us, Lavan's got his eyes on the prize. Yeah. His eyes on the prize. Okay. Now, he has a young sister. Exactly how young he, she is, she could be three, she could be 13. She's young. And he, Eliezer makes it clear that they're, that he's interested <laughs> in Rivka for Yitzchak. And what happens is they seem to agree. They say, Lavan and Basuel, her father, say, this, has, this is from God, this thing. How could we speak against it? Obviously, because he tells him the whole story with the sign that he got. And so this is from God. So what can we do? We've got to do it. So what happens is, after he hears that, he proceeds to give all of the possessions, all the stuff on the camels, to Rivka except for some sweets. He's got some sweets that he gives to the Sewell and his family, including Lava. So it says that. It says he, he takes all the silver and the gold and the clothing, and he gives it to Rivka. And he gives sweets to Lava and her mother. And they ate and drank. And then they said to him, you know what? Why don't you 
hang around here for a while. He was he was going to be able to go the next day with Rivka, but once he gave away all the stuff on the camels, the whole thing that excited them about Eliezer's visit and the shidduch with Rivka was the wealth that they thought was about to be transmitted to them. But he ends up trans giving it to Rivka, which means it's all going to go back with them, and she's going to have it with Yitzchak. So now they have nothing, and suddenly they're delaying. Why don't you stay here? They say to him, he's ready to go. And they say, you know what? Why don't you stay here for a few days, maybe 10 days? Who knows? And then you guys will go later. Because now they have to figure out, they're sort of scrambling to figure out what they're going to do. They somehow need to get the wealth. But they're not overtly doing this. They're, you know, sort of doing it subtext. Yeah. So they say, why don't we ask the girl? If the girl says that she's cool with going with you, she goes with you. Now, they're certain she's not going to say she wants to go with them. What girl would go with some strange guy off to somewhere far away? She's a little girl. She she's in the house. Anybody. Right. So when they say, why don't we ask the girl? He is a teenager. <laughs> there, yeah, but I'm saying at the most, maybe she might be 13. She might be younger than that. But even so, you're being asked, you're somebody being raised in the house. What are the what is the likelihood? So when they ask her, I'm saying this all from the text. If you read the text, I am suggesting this suggests itself, maybe not. But but they why would they ask a girl where she if she wants to go with them? They because they're the they ones expect her to say no. Yes, they expect her to say no. So then they bring her in and she says, <laughs> Yes, I will go with them. So their entire like everything has fallen apart. First of all. They're expecting this big payday. It all ends up going to Rivka. And then they are ass assuming that she's going to say no and that they're going to, I guess, be. it's going to be part of some tough negotiations between them and Eliezer to get her out of there. But so they put it in her hands and she says, I'm going to go. And so it picks, they, he picks up and he goes with her, and they're just, you could imagine them watching as Rivka goes off and the 10 camels laden with all the riches and stuff. Did and, she take uh, maidens with her? Um, I think they did. I think it says uh, with her, with her nursemaid. Nurse. Right, yeah. her nursemaid. So, um, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Is it unusual or was it unusual in the Torah for for the dad to not just make the final decision and for him to ask the girl, ask the woman what she also. wanted? Well, I I don't I don't I think if you look through Tanakh, you're gonna see several marriages. It seemed like the norm is for the parents to yeah. take care of the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's you're going to see any any example up until about a hundred years ago, <laughs> <laughs> where people ask the girl, "What do you think? Do you want to marry him?" Um, in in certainly not in, not in that part of the world, but it, um, so. It's a. It's got some wonderful characteristics to it. Um, what is troubling to a lot of people, including the Medrash, is why so much time, why is so much ink spent on this story? This is one of the longest stories in the Torah. And part of the reason it's long 
is because Eliezer, on his way, first of all, he has the discussion with Abram. Then as he's traveling, he has a conversation with God. And then we hear, and he asks that he get a sign that when he gets to this family, he get a sign to indicate to him that this is the right one. And then the sign works and it is the right one. Then he tells the whole story over to the family about what happened. So even without that, it would be a pretty long story. But with that, it's a very long story. And you have like the at one point the the I think the language of the midrash I think Rashi quotes the midrash somewhere. My quote towards the beginning, but the language of the midrash is something to the effect, which which is we have all this talk from Eliezer. And it seems like part of the question is, and we have so little talk from other figures in the Torah that we would like to hear from, including Yitzchak. Match up all the quotes you have from Yitzchak talking to Eliezer. Eliezer probably has not beat like 10 times, 10 times over. Um, how about some of the tribes? Wouldn't you like to hear what Yehuda had to say about things or Yisachar or Zavulun or we, we get like a line here, a terse remark there. And here is this person who's not even named, the servant of Abraham. And we're getting his prayer and we're getting his, his, his telling over of the whole story besides everything else. It's just remarkable. Is it a is it a part of the story that they tried to poison him? No, and not in the text. Not in the text. You just in the text, the clue to something being a problem is that Basuel was there at the beginning, but suddenly he's not there anymore. It starts to mention the brother and the mother, but there's no discussion of the father. The question is, where's the father? And why isn't the father part of the negotiations? Um, so he could have been watching football. That was one option. But the Medrash, the Medrash says that they were trying to poison Eliezer and they ended up that Basuo got poisoned. But that's in the Midrash. That's not in the, in the text itself. Thank you. But if you're welcome. So, um, yeah, so also what's interesting about this story is that you can tell right away that Eliezer is concerned about this trip because he says so. <laughs> I mean, he, he says so right away. He said, you know, he says, what, what if... Uh, Can you hear? So he asked him, what if the woman doesn't want to come with me to this land? And he said, can I bring Yitzhak with me? And Avram tells him, no, you can't bring Yitzhak. So, and, and then once he's on the trip, it's clear that he's being left to pick the wife for Yitzhak. It's not like he's just being sent to bring somebody who Avram and right. that had, a, had his eye on or, or that had heard about. He's being sent to pick the wife and then he has to figure out how to get her to come with him. 
this is a lot of responsibility being handed over to this servant. Again, it did say that he's been with Avram a long time. He's an elder of his household and that he runs Avram's household. But that's a lot of responsibility to put on a servant. Especially since he's bringing home the mother of a lot of kids. Yeah, he's not just... Of the whole he, bloodline. Right. He's not just picking a wife. He's, he's picking a wife for Yitzchak. So, lately I've been thinking that this is an opportunity uh, for us to focus on what it means to be a servant. I've mentioned to you in the past that we are at a deficit when we pray, even when we study much of Tanakh, and certainly when we pray, because we've never experienced a king. Although the King of England gave a speech yesterday or the day before, and I did see several movies and I did watch The Crown which includes a king at the beginning. Um, but otherwise, we don't have an experience of a king. And God is referred to as a king in every simple, every single blessing that we make. It's a relied upon image when it comes to our relationship with God. The expectation is that when we use the word king, we have something that we can relate to in our own lives that allows us to then sort of transfer that to our relationship with God. But we have no experience with kings. Ramosha Shapiro of Blessed Memory was once in England for the wedding of a friend of mine and a bunch of my other friends were there that were, we were all in his class in Ramosha Shapiro's shear. And he called one of them and he said he'd like to go to Buckingham Palace, to which they found surprising <laughs> that he wanted to do something touristy. And then they went to Buckingham Palace. And at one point he stood off on his own and he sort of closed his eyes and was, they said he even was like shuckling a little bit, you know, like, but he was taking it in. And he told them afterwards that he's never been around the trappings of a king or of royalty. And he wanted to gather some of the aura, even though. He said, there's not much here, you know, like, as far as the kingship or, or royalty is concerned, but there was something, there's some vestige of it. I think they even took him to the crown to see the crown jewels so that he could experience some of that <clears throat> awe and splendor that are associated with, with a king. So we are at a great deficit because we don't, have experience with one of the main metaphors that we use for God. We're also <laughs> at, and I've mentioned this before, we're also at a deficit because we don't know what a servant is about. And that's another huge image that is used to describe our relationship to God. We are the servant, he is the king. So we don't know what a king is and we don't know what a, what a servant is.
So I'm suggesting that the reason this is here, not the reason, but a reason that this is here is because it's the modeling of what a servant does. If you think about the prowess of Elia, he would tell you it's not his prowess because he prayed for this and his prayers were answered. He feels like he had divine help. It, the truth is, Avram did tell him. Avram said, I'm sending an angel with you. And there are some who suggest that when he's praying, he's really talking to the angel. who's accompanying him. Um, so, so when he's asking for this thing, he's sort of asking the angel to do it for him, which is identical to asking God to do it for you because really angels are an expression of God. So that's what he would tell you. But if we're watching this, and certainly that is true, it's true of everything we do too, that God helps us with the things that we do. But if we're watching this, it is an absolute remarkable thing what he executes. He comes back with Rivka, who is one of our matriarchs, and she certainly fills the role. She is a great matriarch, and she plays a crucial role, especially um, when it comes to the issue with the blessings and, and getting Yaakov to go in and get those blessings. She plays an absolute crucial role over there. So she is, and and by the, and by also even by the description at the end of this week's Torah portion, the text seems to suggest that right away it was evident that she was the next matriarch. Because it says she goes, Yitzhak brings her into the tent. of Sarah, his mother. That's how it characterizes it. He brings her into the tent of Sarah's mother. And uh, I think Rashi quotes the Medrash that when his mother was there, there was always a light lit from one Friday to another. And there was bracha in the dough and there was like a, a like some kind of an or a cloud over the tent. Another cloud, right? And and it's supposed to be that kind of cloud, yeah. you know, like that cloud of glory kind of cloud. Or, or Arya Kaplan, Rabbi Arya Kaplan, in one place suggested you might also call it some kind of an aura, like there was an aura there. So when when Sora was there, that's that's what was in the tent, and when he. And then she passed away and there was no more light. There was no more bracha in the bread. There was no more um, cloud over it. But when he brought Rivka, it all returned. So these are images that suggest that even right away, you could sort of sense that she was the next matriarch. She was the next generation. Before her, there was Sora, and now there's her, there's Rivka. Maybe that's why it's such a long story. Right. So you could say that too, that when you're, th th you could argue that's an interesting way of looking at it, that this is really about Rivka somehow. That would be an interesting approach. I have to think about it for a while, but that's comes. So, all right. So if you're looking at this, um, watching what he accomplishes it's it's just absolutely remarkable he and we know what it's like to get mixed up with love him yaakov's not going to get out of there for 20 years once he gets stuck with love on you can't leave and if it wouldn't be for divine intervention he wouldn't have been able to leave because when he tried to leave love was chasing after him ready to kill him 
It's God had to come into a dream and tell Lavan, don't touch him. Because otherwise it would have, uh, you, you do not, when you get associated with Lavan, you never get out. Yeah. And he ends up going in, getting what he needs and leaving. And it costs him a few sweets in the bargain. If you look, if, if, if this was one of those shows about a con artist, you know, like somebody who can, this, this would be like that. Like you, you, you go in and you come out with exactly what it is that you wanted to come out with. And all the scheming people around you are left to watch you leave. There's quite a few movies about people in situations sort of like this that could have been modeled after the servant of Abraham. To me, when I think about what it means to be a servant, I think the number one requirement is that you can reliably do the work that the master wants to get done. He knows that he's capable of this. That's why he sends him on it. And he rewards his trust in him by coming back with exactly what he's supposed to come back with. Now, again, you could say he's also relying on God's help and this angel and other things in order to make it happen. But the focus of the text is on the Ebed. And even the choice to pray about it and what his plan's going to be seems to emerge from the Ebed himself. He's being asked to do a task and he's being trusted to accomplish it. And to me, that is the number one criteria for an Evet. That when it comes time to get something done, you can get it done. So when we're called an Ebed Hashem, when we're called servants of God, first you were slaves to Paro, but now you're my servants. That's what God says to us. And in many different places, we're reminded that we're God's servants. The emphasis on us being servants you know, for us, again, what do we know about them? What we think about is lack of freedom, that a servant is in a position where they're completely beholden to the master. They don't own their own things. They don't have a private life that's not, that's just theirs. They are completely beholden to the master. That's what we tend to think about when you think about slavery. You, you think about coercion and lack of freedom or servitude, coercion and lack of freedom. But that's not what servitude is really about. That doesn't sum up servitude. What sums up servitude is that somebody is relying on you to accomplish something for them. Now, you could have a servant where their whole responsibility is to dust, to do the dusting, or a servant whose whole responsibility is to work in the kitchen. But this kind of a servant, this kind of a servant is the long reach of the master. This is the servant who's going to accomplish an act of, on behalf of the master to 
accomplish something that is very dear, very important to him, very sacred. That kind of a servant has to have demonstrated that they can be trusted to follow through. At some point, we're going to read about the fact that we are God's chosen people. And that often comes up, especially when uh, you're talking Bible with people that aren't Jewish. And most commonly, when a Jew responds to that, they say it doesn't mean that we're necessarily better than anybody else. It just means that God has some kind of plan. He has some kind of mission and he needs the Jewish people to make that happen, to accomplish it for him. We often think about trust in our relationship with God. We ask the question, can we trust God? But the most profound question is, can God trust us? He set things up for some reason that although he he, first, he created the earth and all the natural laws and everything that's in it, but he left it to be managed by us. That's what he suggests. And the blessing originally by us, I mean all of humankind, but in the original blessing that he gives to Adam, to the first human, he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, be keep shuha which can be translated as settle it or conquer it, and then manage the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the, and the animals. You like the bells. So he put us in, in, the, in the first description of creation. Seems like he put us in charge. Rabbi Foreman calls it middle management or middle management. He created it, but then he wants us to manage it. He wants us to take care of it. In the second chapter, it, it describes responsibilities as to work the garden and to keep it or to guard it. He's got responsibilities for us. At one point it says it had not rained yet because there was no person to work the land. The Midrash says there was no person to recognize that you need rain for the produce to grow and that well, but once man sees it man's going to pray for it and that's how there's going to be rain so you see and if you look over and over and over as you sort of sift through the data that the torah presents you see more and more of these kinds of things god's got tasks for us he has he has things that he needs accomplished he wants us to work on his behalf to extend his dominion or his kingship or but it has to happen through us through us as human beings and then at some point he has a special task the special task he tells avram and yitzhak and yaakov this task is going to require them to produce a, 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 a nation and this nation is going to get its land but that's just the beginning we are going to get a mandate we're going to get a mission and he needs us to accomplish it and if we if we don't accomplish it it will be catastrophic it's absolutely essential that we carry it forward in that sense we are servants what what does it mean for us to be servants we are like a servant extensions of the master. We are carrying out the work of the master on behalf of the master. In that sense, we are servants. 
it's not necessarily that again a lot of people when they read it the first thing that comes to our mind is that the job of the that the being a servant means you're not free but that's not not in service in service that's not what is coming to your mind every day. What's coming to your mind every day is how do I do my service? And you want to do your service in a way that will please the master. He's got something he needs done. I want to do it in a way that's even better than what he was planning. That is the, the real satisfaction of a servant. In the first episode of Downton Abbey, there's this cousin who comes to visit. He's not just some cousin coming to visit. He is most likely going to be the next master of Downton Abbey. There's a rule in England that it has to be handed over to a male heir. The present um, family of, of the Abbey are um, of the estate uh, only as daughters. And so they can't, for some reason, inherit it. But uh, so it needs a male heir. So there's this cousin coming. And this cousin is not used to living with servants. He's like an attorney, he works in town, he's like, he's like, he's like. And so he is given a valet, which they call a valet in England. And the purpose of the valet, while he's there, the purpose of the valet is to dress him. And he is uncomfortable with that because he's uncomfortable with the whole notion of servants. And he thinks he's doing the guy a favor by telling him, don't worry, you don't need to dress me. You don't need to put on my clothing. I'll take care of everything. But you, you see that the valet is hu insulted and humiliated because what he does is not being valued. Mm -hmm. That his satisfaction comes from doing what it is that he does well. That's where the satisfaction comes from when you're in service. And there is some of the kind of ethos of, of, the, of the service that comes through um, in the portrayal of the Downs, you know, the, the service at Downton Abbey. Also in that show, Upstairs, Downstairs, um, that that there is a kind of ethos of the service and that it's, it can be an honor and something that you take pride in to do service and to do it well. When we're asked to be the servants of God, when we're told we're the servants of God, we're being told that this, in our relationship with God, this is a, a part of it. This is a big part of it that we are being called into service by God for a particular mission. And we, what, our pride and position require that we do the best job that we can. There could probably be nothing worse for a person who's grown up with that ethos and has lived it to find that they are not trusted. That the master is going to use somebody else to accomplish this mission because he doesn't believe or she doesn't believe that you would be able to fulfill it. more than when we talk about trust in the relationship between us and God, more than can we trust God, we need God 
to trust us. We, we need him to believe that we can follow through on what it is that he needs to get done. We need him to know that we can accomplish what he needs for us to get done. And this is the subject. Right, but it's not even about, let's say, again, I think it would be more deeply painful than any anger he would have that I don't complete it if I knew he didn't think I could complete it. True. Especially in, in my relationship with him. If he didn't think I could complete it. How would I convince him that I could? It's because he sent me on other tasks and I completed those tasks. So after a while, he's come to trust me. He's come to rely on me because I've completed other tasks that he sent me on. He's probably going to have sent me on a lot of tasks before he ever asked me to do something that really deeply matters. Rabbi? Yeah. Then should we assume then that he did not think that we could leave Egypt by ourselves? And after... He doing that for us, everything else followed from that. We seem to say it all the time, you know, because you took us out of Egypt. That was a task that we could not accomplish. No, you you said it. You can't accomplish it on your own. There may not right. be nothing that we can accomplish on our own, really on our own. And even with this story with Eliezer, he right away is beseeching God to help him. It doesn't seem to be part of the rules that God won't help us. It just seems to be that God's not going to do it for us. Even, even leaving Egypt, like for instance, you'll, you'll see this in, in uh, Hasidic writings and in mystical writings. We, there were certain, there's always something we have to do from below before there is help from above. That's where the saying, God helps those who help themselves. Right. Well, that, we have to call out. but right. Sometimes pain. it might be to call out, but when it was to cross the, when it was to cross the exactly. Red Sea, he says, why are you call, Why are you shouting at me? In yeah. other words, just cross the sea. There seems to be times when he's going to respond and send all the troops. And there's going to be times when he's going to ask us to do it on our own and uh you know there but it it even there is no rule that we're going to have to do it by ourselves but the notion of servitude the notion of chosenness that there and i believe that a big part of why this story is here and expressed in such detail is because this is our role. Humanity in general has a role uh, in God's plan. And then we have a specific role in his plan. And that when he identifies it, us as his avadim, what he's signaling to us is that he needs us to do things. You could say, make the right choice is <laughs> you know it might there might be some people we'll call them the minimalists when it comes to free will who would say that making the right choice is what's in our hands and everything else is in god's hands or you could have the other side of the spectrum that gives a lot more um work to man that free will is something that is more perhaps extends beyond just an initial choice. Um, exactly how much freedom we have in the whole thing and how much we're actually doing and how much God's doing. Um, you know, there's debate and discussion about it. And there are many situations where we don't know at all 
how much we did on our own and how much God did. But there does seem to be something that he needs us to take care of. And he puts us in this circumstance for that reason. We are much like Avram was, uh, as I was suggesting the last couple times, where we don't always know what the mission is. We don't know where we're going. <laughs> we don't necessarily know why we're going. But, uh, um, and that we're, that's part of our trusting him. The, I heard this quote in, in the name of Rav Nachman of Breslov and also the Baal Shem Tov. But um, they say that if you find yourself someplace and you're not sure why you're there, be on your best behavior because most likely you're there for some mission that God has and you want to make sure that you fulfill it. So just be on your best behavior. What if God needed somebody to be somewhere so that you, they would see your smile and they were in some kind of downward spiral and by seeing your smile, they are suddenly popped out of the downward spiral and their day turns around and maybe their life turns around. What if it was something like that? You may never know. You're at some airport, you got diverted. You don't know why you're there. You're there for a couple hours. Um, so they would counsel you, be on your best behavior. Maybe look around a little bit and see why you might be there, but you, you may never know why you're there. So be on your best behavior so that you make sure that you accomplished whatever it was that you were sent there for. This, you, this is obviously, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a scale. Uh, one, and, and, you know, who knows where each one of us as individuals you know, works out on this scale. But our, you as servants, our goal would be to be reliable and capable, reliable and capable. And how do you get to be reliable and capable? Practice. We get there by practice. We have all sorts of tasks. Of Shmuel Dishon was one of the great speakers and storytellers and he does a lot of other things that are great, or did a lot of other things that were great. But he has this, he tells this story about how he was on the turnpike and he was hungry and thirsty. So he stopped at one of the rest stops and he's in the food, you know, the little kiosk kind of place where they have food. And he, uh, and he's, uh, looking around for something that he can eat or drink. And a young man comes up to him and, and he says, uh, I, I see that you're looking to see what's kosher. Um, and then the young man said, I feel bad for you because uh, you, know, you come to a place like this and there might not be very much that's kosher for you to have. So Shmuel Dishon said, it was only because I was hungry and thirsty at the time that I did this. He said, I, I wouldn't have done it otherwise. But I turned to him and I said, I feel bad for you. He said, because one day God's going to ask me to do something that's very hard. And there's a chance I'm going to be able to do it. And that's because I've been practicing my whole life to do things. Not always very hard, but I've been practicing, you know little things here, little things there. So one day when he asked me to do something really hard, I have a chance of doing it because I've been practicing, but you haven't been practicing. What's gonna happen if he gives you a big test or a big challenge or a big mission? How are you going to accomplish it? I say Rabbi, we do this again. Yes, yes, wait. <laughs> One question, if you don't mind. Um, so if the story is about um, practicing being a servant, then he's, you know, the example. So in this particular story, Abraham is like in the place of God. He's sending 
his yeah. servant to do it. I would yeah. wonder who Yitzchak is and who we are protecting. I just <laughs> like to know. <laughs> what you mean in the, what do you if, mean? If we take this story as, you know, Abraham is like, like Hashem sending, sending Eliezer for a particular purpose for his son. I wonder in the story, we are the servants. We're Eliezer. Abraham is Hashem. And who is Yitzchak? <laughs> right. That's interesting. I like it. Uh, a thought popped into my head. I did have a thought that popped into my head. Interesting. Right. I'm sure mystics, you know, would tell you that this all has to do with the spheros. But you could say that he's he, next in line to well, the scrolls. Now, but he's looking to. Uh, the he might be the rest of humanity that we're that protecting. Might, her. It could be. It could be, or or something like the completion of humanity. Because when he when he brings Rivka to Yitzchak, he's bringing like now. Now Yitzchak is whole, so you could say it's um, you know something like um, wholeness or or perfection or completion or something. Yeah, and that Yitzchak might represent um, all of mankind in that thing. I know that's interesting. That's a good good challenge. We got two good ones today. We got Liz's and Lois's. Also, uh, this is happening more and more. I did not mention this at the beginning. I am mentioning it now that um, uh, our learning uh, tonight was in the merit of the speedy uh, and healthy return of the hostages, of the healing for uh, anyone who's injured, of the protection, of the, of the comfort for those who are bereaved, um, the protection of everyone in Israel and for protection of all of us and may Mashiach come be mehera be amenum.